All right. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and rose again the third day. My name is Brother Ed, and I have Brother Mike Basile with me this evening. And uh, we were hoping that uh, Brother Justin Whitland would partake with us this evening. And uh, if he pops in, I'll just kind of key him in if he gets in a little bit late. Because remember, uh, Justin is working full time. He's a very busy man. Uh, just have some grace with Brother Justin. Uh, he tries to come on as much as he can. But uh, if he can't, then we'll just try our best to do it ourselves. So... Um, this is the Monday Night Bible Q&A, and we do this 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Florida Time, USA. If you would like to uh, join with us, uh, and you're in another country, account for the time difference, and you can join with us live here. We would love to have you uh, join us and uh, be able to ask your question. If you'd like to ask a question, if you look on the bottom of your screen, uh, you can email us at trust the Lord Jesus at gmail.com. That's trust the Lord Jesus at gmail.com. Just email the, your question there uh, concerning your Bible question. And uh, during the week, we will do our best to study and answer for you. And then the following Monday or the following Monday's plurality, because sometimes we can't get to the questions right away because we have a list. So your question will be added to the list, and then we will do our best to get to each and every question. We will not skip questions. We will go through each and every question. So rest assured, even though I'm not posting all the questions on the screen right now, that I have all the questions that people have emailed, and they will be answered. So I hope that you guys can join with, with us live here on Facebook Live, or if you don't like Facebook, I normally re-upload these to, the, to my YouTube channel. That's KJV Bible Scope YouTube channel. And you can just uh, type in KJV Bible Scope in your search engine, Google, whatever, and uh, you'll pump you'll bump right into uh, my YouTube channel. And then you can look at the playlists and you can find Monday Night Bible Q&A 2021 and you'll find all of the playlists concerning the Monday Night Bible Q&A there. Okay, so hopefully, you know, you you do that and we hope, we'd be glad that if you uh, hopped in and learned something new you never knew before, if you're saved and if you're lost, here's the most important question of them all in a Bible Q&A. Where will your soul spend eternity? Yeah. And we don't want anybody to die in their sins, especially with a lack of knowledge of what any of us that are saved could tell could tell you or anybody that's lost, which is the Lord loved you so much that he sent his only begotten son to die on a cross for your sins and rise again the third day. And he did that over 2000 years ago. But what's so miraculous is that what happened over 2000 years ago, because Jesus being God was the miraculous power of his resurrection and in that resurrection was his finished work that he would do for all mankind past present and future that if anybody would believe and trust in jesus christ even though he did it in a point of time over two thousand years ago he is enabled to save you from your sins because of his complete work that was uh accepted by the father and that would be the redemptive plan for all mankind throughout all ages. If you would believe and trust that Jesus died for your sins, rose again a third day, you'd have eternal life, reconciliation of, to God, and forgiveness of sins. What a powerful, powerful uh, redemption plan that only one true God supplies to mankind. All other ways are false. All other religions are false. They're, a lot of them are based in steel and knock off truth from the word of God. But I'm telling you, you know in the heart of your hearts that this God, when you hear this message, supplied us with the complete sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. And you would do well to consider this very seriously. Mm -hmm. um, now that we are bringing this up right now and it's fresh in your mind, uh, you would do well to think seriously about the question, where will your soul spend eternity? And look at the Bible. Look at the gospel message we're telling you that you need to believe. Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It didn't say multiple ways, only one way. So please, if you're not saved today, consider that gospel message because it's a message of love and compassion and God wants you to be saved, but you've got to be willing to receive 
the free gift of salvation of Jesus Christ. I'm going to go ahead and let Mike open up. Go ahead, brother. Well, good evening. Again, the most important thing we can ask you is, is your eternity settled? Um, God is the author of my salvation. It's not my salvation. It's his salvation. I didn't do anything to get saved. He gave me a free gift of salvation. It's of the Lord. If you're not saved, that's the most important thing you can do right now. We're, we're glad you're here. We're glad you have an interest in God's word. But eternity is awaiting for all of us. Um, I do enjoy this these Bible studies. I, I do enjoy the broadcast. It helps me to study. I hope that you're you're getting a blessing. Out of this. I should get a blessing out of this. Um, but the most again, the most important thing, please, 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 if you're not saved, consider your everlasting eternal soul and where you're going to spend eternity. And that's the most important thing we can say. Brother Ed? Hey, man, appreciate that, Brother Mike. And uh, always great serving with Mike in the ministry. Just uh, he's uh, always been a blessing uh, to me and my family as well as our church. And I'm just I'm just glad that he was able to get on this evening. So let's go ahead and we're going to go to the first question here. And it is from Larry Roach. Now, I, I haven't seen him on uh, recently. Now, he asked this question a few weeks ago. And um, I'm going to go ahead and throw it on the screen here. And there it is. And he asked this question. I don't know if it was a question to kind of throw something out there that maybe he thought that Christianity couldn't answer. Or if it was from a sincere heart and he really wants to know this answer, or if it's from a lordship's uh, false doctrine, repentance, salvation type of a uh, of an angle. I don't know the angle. And so there isn't enough uh, detail in the question to really know where he's coming from. And I don't want to assume, I don't want to approach an angle that he's not approaching. So it's, it's going to be pretty tough for us this evening because me and brother Mike are going to approach this at many different angles. Okay. So here it is uh, from Larry Roach. If I was saved, if I was saved and used in the ministry of God and sinned, does that make me unclean again and unable to be used of God? So I'm, well, there it is. I'm going to go ahead and let Mike open up with this one. Go ahead, brother. All right. Well, I'm going to start off by, I'm not, I'm not trying to pick anybody apart, but let's, go, let's start off by looking at the question. The first four words, if I was saved, if you are saved, you're eternally saved. You can't lose it. So the way he's approaching yeah. this question, if I was saved, there's no such thing as was saved. You are saved or you're not saved. So that we need to clear up first. There's no such thing as a was saved person. If, if I am saved and, and was used in the ministry of God and then I sin, if I am saved, I'm still saved. If I sin against God, I'm still saved because God's the one that promised to keep me and to keep me saved. Um, so, um, I want to make sure that is a, a point for us to understand that because the first four words was saved or such a thing. So I, I know it's picking apart the question. That's important. If you think you can lose your salvation, and the way this is written, it's, it looks like it. You cannot lose your salvation because you didn't earn your salvation. Jesus Christ, who cannot lie, told me he would keep me forever. Amen. So, that being said, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 15 and verse 19. Jeremiah 15, 19. Now, this is Old Testament, I understand. Uh, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, if thou return, then I will bring thee again. And thou shalt stand before me, and if thou take forth the precious from the vial, thou shalt be as my mouth. Let them return unto me, but return not thou unto them. Again, I know God is talking to the Jews here. I know this is Old Testament, but it does have a New Testament connotation that I can apply, that you can apply to our lives today. What God is saying here is, if you return, he will receive you. If you return, he will allow you to stand again before him, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, a promise that was given to you the moment you were saved. He will again let you handle his word in witnessing. He does not want you to return to your sinful past. So that's that verse is saying, if thou return, if repent of your sins, turn back to God, you can stand before me, and then you can be as my mouth, you can witness for him again. 
God desires for you to come back to him. God does not want you to stay in your sin. God will help you get out of your sin. God will convict you of your sin. But God is not going to force you to get out of your sin. So that's what that verse is saying. Let's look at a couple other verses. Psalm 51. It's a, that's my, this is my favorite psalm for restoration and, and for sin. David wrote this psalm after he sinned with Bathsheba. Psalm 51, verse 12. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Now, we've got to be careful how we read this. It says restore the joy of salvation, not restore my salvation. Amen. Once saved, always saved, eternal, everlasting, forever. <laughs> Amen. What Je Just, uh, David is saying here is to me, restore unto me the joy of salvation. If you're saved and you're deep in sin, there's no joy in your life. Right. And I love how he says it's the joy of thy salvation. I open with that. It's Jesus Christ is the author of my salvation. It's his salvation. Amen. Saved, but it's his. Every word of God is pure. Every word of God is perfect. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. So God wants to restore you back to him. He wants to give you back that joy, that peace that, that you got from him that you lose. You don't lose your salvation, but you can lose the joy of your salvation. So how do we do that? First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God wants you to be a man or a woman. Own up to your sins. Acknowledge your transgressions. And acknowledge the transgressions are against him. In the garden, Adam and Eve sinned against God. God knew what they did. Cain killed his brother. God knew what he did. But God asked them questions to find out where their hearts were, to find out what incident would give them, to find out they had a repentant spirit and that if they wanted to turn back to him, God wants you to come back to him. And God's going to wait for you. God's not going to force you again. God wants unbroken fellowship with you. And God's not the one that's going to break it. God's not going to break fellowship with you. If you sin against God, you're going to be the one that's going to break that. We always are. You're going to be the one that's going to break that fellowship. Again, can't lose your salvation. But you surely can lose a blessing. You can miss out on fellowship with God. You can miss out on an opportunity to witness. You can miss out on a lot of things while you're in your sin. And God, again, is going to allow you to go as far as you want to in sin because God has given you something called a free will. Now, once you confess our free sins, God will, will jump right in and restore you immediately. God desires to restore you. Psalm 32, verse 5, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin, Selah. I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, not to a priest, not to an imam, not to a fellow brother in Christ, to the Lord. God wants you to take those sins to him because, look at the first part of that verse, I acknowledge my sin unto thee. Your sin is against God. The, um, the, prodigal son, when he came back to his father, he said, I know I've sinned against God and against you. He acknowledged the fact that his sin, even though it hurt his father, was a sin against God. And that's a great example of how you need to own up to your own sin. You need to make sure you understand that that sin is your sin. And you've sinned against a holy and a righteous God. And as soon as you understand that, as soon as you accept the fact that you've sinned and offended the Lord, then you confess it and God accepts it. We confess our sins by praying to God, we pray directly to God. If you are a saved believer, you have access to God whenever you want to. You don't have to go through a, a religious leader. You don't have to go through a religious trial or a religious ceremony. You have access to God right now. Now, whether it's a small transgression or something more serious, now here's where the question has a problem. I don't know what the sin is. I don't know what this guy did. I don't know how horrible that sin was. So for us to answer that question, I'm going to have to give you that answer in layers. So I don't know what his sin was, so I have to assume what the sin was. 
when the Lord makes us aware of our sin by either reading of his word or him shining light upon us, we must immediately admit it. We must immediately ask for forgiveness. Religion will have you go a certain place or a certain person to confess that sin. It's not scriptural. No matter where you are, like I said, as soon as you're made conscious of your sin, you can confess it right away, no matter where you're at. The Lord will accept you as soon as you pray to him. If you're saved, he dwells inside of you. You don't have to go very far to talk to the Lord. He is in you. Now, to confess means to admit or acknowledge your sin. Don't cover it up. Don't act as if you didn't do anything wrong. That is a tendency of a lot of Christians today is to cover up their sin, to make light of their sin, to gloss over their sin, to make themselves feel better. But that, that's not repentance. That's not true going back to God. So how do you know when you've sinned? First John 1 John 1.5. Uh, then this is a message we've heard of him and declaring to you that God is light and in, in him is no darkness at all. God has given us light in our lives. We feel guilty when we sin. We knew of sin before we even knew what the sin was. As a child, you felt guilty when you sinned against your parents, when you broke your parents' rules. God gave you that light. According to Romans 1, you have light that God has given you. He's given every man. So God continues to be our light after salvation and tries to conform us to Jesus, closer to Jesus each and every day. I need to be in prayer. I need to be in his word. I need to make sure my life lines up with what he says. It's righteousness. Instead of trying to justify my sin, I need to agree with God right away and accept that sin and not cover it up. Now, can you be used of God after you sin? Of course. Of course you can. If you are a pastor or a deacon, you need to humble yourself. You can serve in a church. You may not ever be a pastor again. I don't know what the sin is. You may never be a deacon again, but you need to humble yourself and serve in the church to prove to God and the men that you have forsaken that sin and desire to live a life separated to God. That's a hard thing to do. Somebody who used to be a pastor that had fallen into deep sin is not going to be the pastor that church is. Now, sadly, in this world, there are churches where the pastor has committed adultery, left his wife, and married the church secretary, and still is the pastor. That's wicked. That is ungodly. That is not what God has set up in his word. God wants you to grow. He doesn't want you to fall again, but he also doesn't want you to be a stumbling block to those around you. The testimony of the church that you belong to is hurt. It's tainted, and it could be tainted for years to come and maybe forever. Again, there are men in the pulpit right now that committed horrible sins, and that's not a God. Um, it'll, it's going to give those outside the church occasion to blaspheme God. The greatest example in the Bible is probably David with Bathsheba. David committed a wicked sin with Bathsheba. He tried to cover it and had Uriah killed. His wickedness was comp compounded. He tried to cover his sin. And he thought he got away with it until God sent Nathan to confront David. Second Samuel chapter 12, I'm going to start in verse 12. It's, it's a long passage, but I think you need to hear it. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. And he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich, the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. The poor man had nothing but save one ewe lamb which he had brought up and nourished up and it grew together with him and his children it to eat of his own meat and drink of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And it was a traveler a come unto the rich man. He spared to take his own flock of his own herd and dressed it for the wayfaring man that was coming to him, unto him. But he took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come unto him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. Now, when David did, he committed murder and adultery. Those are both death penalty offenses. Stealing someone's lamb wasn't. But David's anger was kindred. As the Lord liveth, the man shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said unto David, Thou art the man. 
Thus saith the Lord of Israel, I know that the king over Israel and delivered thee out of the hand of Saul and gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if it had been too little, I would have more or given you such and such things. What God is saying here is, David, I've given you so much. And if whatever you wanted, I'd have given it to you. But David took of a thing he wasn't supposed to have. Wherefore thou hast despised the plan of the Lord to do evil in thy sight. Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. David never wielded that sword, but in God's eyes, David did. And has taken his wife to be thy wife, and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now there, therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and has taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will, I will raise up evil against thee out of thy own house, I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto your neighbor, and shall that he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of his son, for thou didst secretly. But I will do this thing before all of Israel and before the son. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. It's a good start. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord has put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord, to blaspheme. The child that is born in thee shall surely die. David was restored. Praise the Lord. Eventually. He was used greatly of God. Eventually. And God called him a man after his own heart. But it took time. So my answer to you is yes, God will and can restore you fully. But here's the catch. Men may not. You need to rebuild your testimony. And that takes a long time. You will reap what you've sown. You will need to work harder than ever before. And in many cases, to be an example above what you used to be, to prove to others. Do you love God enough to move forward for him because of him? Do you love God enough to endure, to reap what you've sown? Jesus endured so much for me on the cross. Jesus endured my sin, who had no sin. He humbled himself. And became sin for me. Will you humble yourself and serve God? I don't know what that sin was, and it really doesn't matter what that sin was because God forgive all sin. If he if he was saved, is saved, he still is saved. God will restore him, but God is not a liar; <coughs> he not deceive. So a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Whatever that sin was, whatever however fall far he fell. If he was removed from a pastorship, if he was removed from being a deacon, if he's removed from being a, as a Sunday school teacher, that is something that he may never gain back. You may never gain back. But do you want to serve God? Do you want to fellowship with God's people? There's where you got to have God's heart. You have to be like Jesus. You need to humble yourself. You need to put yourself in a position where God can use you again, and God will use you again. David was used greatly after this thing with Bathsheba. But David, David had to come to the position where he fully humbled himself and laid everything in God's hands and let God restore him. It's going to be a hard thing. It's easy with God. It's hard with men. So that's the answer to the question. Yes, God can restore you. God, yes, God can use you. But do not be so prideful thinking, I used to be a pastor. I'm going to run this next church. You may not. Brother Ed? All right. Appreciate that, Brother Mike. Uh you guys uh, take notes on this. Um, this is a kind of a common question that's uh, asked. Uh, we get asked this question from lost people as well as saved people, maybe uh, people that were Christians and then turned their back on Christianity and are becoming bitter against God. And then this may be one of the questions that they would ask because of the bitterness in their heart. And, uh, People will give the world the benefit of the doubt. People will give philosophy and lost man's devices the benefit of the doubt, but they don't give the benefit of the doubt to God. Uh, they believe in their own heart, which is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, that if one thing doesn't go their way uh, and they're a Christian and it doesn't go their way, they right away condemn God as themselves being the final judge against God. 
And because they didn't understand the word of God, they never uh, sat long enough uh, in Christianity to learn the word of God and to learn the mind of God. Uh, they ended up trusting in their own hearts and then got bitter against God when uh, by their own understanding, turned their back on God. And uh, what a shame that so many, there's a, a epidemic of people doing that. And uh, that's just not Christianity, uh, what these people are doing. So, uh, let's, let me go ahead and I'm going to read the question again here. If I was saved and used in the ministry of God and sinned, does that make me unclean again and unable to be used of God? I find in the very question itself a lack of understanding of salvation, as Mike said earlier, because uh, somebody that knew salvation, at least uh, the fundamental tenets of salvation, uh, already would have reworded this question. I mean, the question wouldn't be asked this way, but I can see that there was a lack of understanding. I don't say that disrespectfully. I say that for what it actually says in the question, okay? So here's my response. Were you really saved? Uh, as Mike said earlier when he opened up, were you really saved? And if you were, how does one get saved? Now, I'm going to share that really quickly. First uh, Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Romans 10, 9, I'll couple that up, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So did you get saved according to what the Bible says salvation is? And if you did, then there must be, come along with it, the understanding that once you're saved, as Mike said earlier, you're always saved because it's Jesus' finished work that saves Amen. us. Amen. So that has to be coupled with you trusting in this gospel message of Christ's finished work on the cross. You have to couple eternal security up with trusting Christ and his finished cross. You have to put those two together. Otherwise, Christ died for nothing. OK, because that's what it boils down to when you don't couple those two together. It, you're just saying Christ died for nothing. And all you got to do is be a good person. So if all you got to do is be a good person and not sin. Well, then Christ came down to this earth and lived a holy, perfect, sinless life, kept all the laws that we supposedly couldn't keep. He did all that for nothing because because we could keep the laws. Right. All of us, could, including Gentiles, we could keep the laws. Well, none of us can keep them. We can't keep them when we were lost, and we certainly ain't keeping them when we're saved. Now, there. Now, listen to me. I, I say that boldly because First uh, John, the book of First John. I would like to go to, to chapter two, but if you just take the whole book as a whole, it's dealing with our fellowship with God, and in the fellowship with God and our relationship with God, there's going to come times where there's troubles in our relationship, just like in any relationship you would have with a human being. If you'd have a friend, there would come troubled times with your friend. If you had a marriage, there'd be come, there would come troubled times in your marriage. But what are we looking for in a best friend? What are we looking for in a successful marriage? We're looking for faithfulness. We're looking for not the, I mean, everybody wants a perfect marriage. Everybody wants a perfect friendship with their best friend. But in reality and practicality, we know that's not the case. So what makes uh, the attributes for being a best friend? What makes up the attributes for having a great marriage or, per or I would say a good marriage, not a perfect marriage, but a good marriage? I would say faithfulness and, not, and knowing that when the times get rough and there's disagreements, that there would be no cause for us uh, for you know, in the times of trouble to be unfaithful, even though we may mess up in certain areas, we may say things we're not supposed to say, but there's this general outlook within the marriage that we would say, okay, there's troubles coming in the marriage. How are we going to handle those troubles? You know, and I don't think, you know, when, when we look at these practical examples of relationships that we have every day in our daily lives, we don't, we don't, contrast that with a relationship with God. Now, true. I, I mean, I understand these are finite examples, but God is a, God is a person and he wants a relationship with you. And in the relationship, he's always faithful. It's kind of like somebody in a marriage where it's one sided, where the person's always faithful as much as they can, but the other one's always messing up. And you know who we are as the church? We're the one that's always messing up all the time. <laughs> We're not faithful all the time in every single area of our lives. 
I mean, that's really boasting if you think you are. I'm pretty sure if any of us could take the magnifying glass out, you would try to come back at us and say, don't, don't the Bible say thou shalt not judge? <laughs> I mean, you pretty much want to go down the road of not wanting to be judged because you know we would find things in your life. So everybody still sins. Everybody still does wrong things, which is sin. So what we have to do is how do we... Now, now mind you... There are sins that we know if we commit, it's going to destroy our marriage. And there are certain other sins that if we commit will cause problems in our marriage, but they can be fixed with a sincere heart and repentance. You can fix that marriage. And there's other things that you can do that may not be so serious where your wife just says or your husband just says, no, I'm done with you. You know, and, and that happens. So with God, who's the righteous, the righteous one in the relationship, he will always do right. He will always be faithful. He will always be trustworthy. He will never do wrong to you, but we will always find a way to do wrong to him. So with that being understood, we still sin. And we love God because he first loved us, but his love is not based upon our doing right every single time of every single day and every single thought, action, and deed. His love is based upon his unconditional attribute because God is love. He loves you. Even when you sin, he loves you. It, just because I say God loves you even when you sin doesn't mean he's approving of you sinning. I'm not saying that by no means, but he still loves you. Just as a father loves his child, even when his child sins, uh, the father reaches out to the child and tries to explain or chastise or spank the child and say, I don't want you to go down this road. It's going to lead to a, a, a life of disaster, a life of trouble, because he loves his child. And so God, our father, has a more perfect love than a finite father does and does the same for us. So I, you, you need to understand that the relationship we have with God is infinite, infinitely better than what we could fathom with earthly relationships. But I'm just you can see I'm using some contrast there. So were you really saved? How does one get saved? We covered that. What does it mean to be used in the ministry of God? Look at 2 Corinthians 5.17. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature until he messes up. Nope, doesn't say that. Uh, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That would be great if it was an actual reality in the lives of believers. But the problem is, is believers are living their lives like this. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, He's, an, he's still an old creature, wants to be a new creature, but can't do it because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So I am unable to be this new creature because I mess up all the time. And old things can be passed away, but I'm just not powerful enough because this flesh is so powerful. I get tempted all the time. You know, my friends are, you know, I hang around all my sinful friends and they, they want to bring me out to these sinful places and all things could become new, but I'm just not allowing them to become new because I still have some desires to sin. That's how people are living 2 Corinthians 5.17. It's not in the reality what it actually says. It's what they want it to say. In the flesh. So that's not, that's not what it's teaching there. But the Bible says you are a new creature. And verse 18 says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by who? By Jesus Christ. You're not reconciled by keeping good deeds, good works, all the good that you could ever do in your life. Will not reconcile you to God if you never were saved and didn't have Jesus Christ. You have to have Jesus Christ because he is the reconciliation to God the Father. So he or all things are of God who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and have given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So what's the ministry of God? It's the ministry of reconciliation. Well, for me to have the ministry of reconciliation, for God to entrust me with the ministry of reconciliation, I have to be reconciled myself first. Right. 
How am I going to preach to anybody else the ministry of reconciliation when I myself hasn't, haven't been ministered the ministry of reconciliation so I can get saved to be reconciled to God? So if I'm reconciled to God and, and I am enabled to minister to others, then wouldn't that me being reconciled to God be proof positive that I'm saved forever? And now I want to share that reconciliation with other people so they can be saved forever and have reconciliation forever with God? Certainly, certainly that would be the case. So this whole ministry of reconciliation is huge on eternal security because it says I am reconciled past tense the moment I believe. It didn't say I'm reconciled until the next time I sin and then I must be reconciled again. And then again when I sin again and then I need to be reconciled again when I sin again. It's one time reconciliation. And that's that. Now, listen, we're talking about the ministry of God. If I sin, can I still be used of God in the ministry of God? Well, I've already been reconciled. I still sin. But Jesus Christ ministers to me as a saved member of the body of Christ, as Mike stated in 1 John 1. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is not getting saved again. That is not being reconciled again because you lost reconciliation because you sinned after you were saved. That's not what that means. It means I'm already saved, but sometimes I fall down. Sometimes I mess up. Sometimes I sin, whether willingfully or ignorantly. Sometimes I sin. And I can go to God, Jesus Christ the righteous, my advocate with the Father, and I can confess my sins, and he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me. Come on, concerning our relationship. He can cleanse me. I can't cleanse God. He never does anything wrong. God doesn't need an advocate. Jesus is the advocate for us. So see how it's one-sided? We always need to be the one to fix our relationship with God because we're always the one leaving, uh, leaving the relationship. We're always the one going towards sin. The Bible talks about in Hebrews, the sin that so easily besets us. It's so easy for us to go to sin, even though God has did so much for us that he does not deserve that. He doesn't deserve us cheating behind his back with sin and other gods and making idols in our heart. God doesn't deserve that. But yet, even though we give God this Come on, we're not a blessing to God most of the time, are we? Come on, when we're turning to darkness instead of light as saved members of the body of Christ, we're not being a blessing to God. But every day, even in the darkness of my sin as a saved member of the body of Christ, even though my presumptuous sinning, God is still there with his hand out. Say, come back to me. Come on, you guys remember the prodigal son? He's not the prodigal son anymore, but he used to be. But you know what? Why do, why do all of us desire to be like the prodigal son? We may not try to think of it that way, but a lot of times because we ye- keep yielding to the old ways, we end up just like him. And some come back and some don't. And what a shame for you not to come back to God. Not to get saved again. But to fix the relationship that was broken, not that God broke, but that you broke. And see, what happens is is people think that they walk away from God, that somehow God doesn't want to accept them anymore. He doesn't want them to come back to him anymore because, well, I've already sinned and I can't be accepted of God anymore. And that's a that is a false premise. That is a false idea. Because because you sinned, you got so much pride to think that God won't accept you anymore when God had already told you in his word. There is no sin that you can commit that can separate my love from you if, you, if you've if you already trusted in me and trusted in my only begotten son and the Lord Jesus Christ and his cross work. If you've already did that. There's nothing that can separate you from my love. He said that in Romans 8. And you know, you know, you know what we do? We think that Somehow our sins are so bad, even after we got saved. Oh, I'm, I'm such a disgrace. I'm a disgrace to God. God couldn't accept me. Look at what I did. Look at all the, the sexual immorality that I did after I was saved. Look at all this wicked drinking and drunkenness that I've been doing after I'm saved. There's no way God can accept me now after I'm saved. There, there has to be some miraculous thing where I can lose my salvation because God can't accept me like this. 
And you know what it is? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You can't know how deceitful your heart is when, when you're thinking those thoughts. And you know what you're doing? You are calling God in your thoughts and in your heart. You're calling God a liar. You're saying, my sin can keep my salvation away from eternal security. If I sin, I can't have eternal security. And that's, that's not true because we all sin. Every single one of us. Said, the best man that ever lived on earth. And we're not talking about Jesus. We're talking about Paul. The best man that ever lived on earth was a sinner, altogether a sinner. And he, and he says, this is a faithful saying. This is Paul talking. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul called himself the chief sinner. You know, Paul ain't the chief sinner. You know who's the chief sinner? We are. Amen. I think every single human being should own up that they're the chief sinner. And when you can do that, that's a humble position. Because I, I think I think to say, even, even in a way that, you know, I'm just a sinner. I, I, I say, I'm a wicked sinner. <laughs> to say I'm just a sinner would be a little bit of pride there. Well, I'm not as, I'm a sinner, but I'm not as bad as a sinner as this guy. But we should all see ourselves as sinners uh, and wicked sinners at that. So what does it mean if a Christian sins versus when a lost person sins? And I think that would be need to be understood in the question as well. Christians have already received the Savior for the salvation of their soul. First Timothy 2, 5 to 6, right? And after salvation, we still have an advocate, Jesus Christ, right? First John 2, 1 to 2. Lost people have no way to have forgiveness of sins or forgiveness concerning sinning in their relationship to God because they have no relationship to God. I'm not saying they can, couldn't get saved and then have a relationship with God, but if they remain in their situation, in their predicament, they have no Savior. They have no forgiveness of sins. And if they remain that way, they'll die in their sins. So there's no forgiveness. There's no reconciliation for them right now in the state that they're in. So that's Isaiah 59, 1 to 2. So how can you be unclean again after you're saved? I don't understand that idea. I mean, just the idea of being unclean, Isaiah 64, 6, we are all as an unclean thing, and all of our righteousness are as filthy rags. Now, I believe that concerning the human being and the nature of the human being, if, if, if in my human nature, in my flesh, as a saved member of the body of flesh, in, in my nature, in the body of flesh, if I'm trying to do something by my own power for God, God says it's a filthy rag, even after, after I'm saved. But if I do it in Christ, if I do it by faith, then God looks at that and he says, that's not a filthy rag because that's done in faith, right? Hebrews eleven six. 6. But without faith, here it is. It is impossible to please him. So if I do it in faith, it pleases him. But if I do it in the flesh, it doesn't please him, even as a saved member of the body of Christ. How much more if you're lost and undone, any good deed that you could ever do, no matter how great the deed is. It's a filthy rag to God. God says, you're not getting to heaven. You're not going to get forgiveness of sins. You'll not get reconciliation to God. You'll not have any of this. And so that's kind of the point that I'm trying to make about the unclean. And uh, how could you be unclean again concerning being lost? You couldn't be. I mean, I just said it. Certainly there are certain works that we can do as a same member of the body of Christ that we do in the flesh that would be unclean to God. But... There are other works that we can do in Christ, as I said. But think about this thought. I can never be unclean concerning my soul. Amen. Amen. My soul can never be unclean. Why? Because Jesus has sanctified my soul. He separate. He took my soul. Come on. Sanctification. You understand it? It's separated unto God. It means God separated out my soul for himself. And, and Mike said it earlier. He keeps my soul. And my soul is completely righteous in the eyes of God. And anybody that's saved has the same phenomenon with their soul. Okay? All right. So a little bit of that. If you are used in the ministry of God, there would be understanding that there is a responsibility to the ministry of God, just like there are responsibilities in any job you do, but now much more the ministry of the one true God through the gospel of Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians 6.3. 
giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. So is it possible for somebody to serve God and then end up destroying his testimony and the ministry being blamed? Yes. That's why the warnings there in 2 Corinthians 6, 3, there's a warning there because people have done that. And there's people doing that today. It's all been throughout all spans of time um, concerning the church over 2000 years that this warning has to be given because people are destroying their testimony and the ministry is being blamed. And so now I have to talk to people and I got to I got to deal with all of the refutes that people have of why they don't believe in Jesus Christ, because all the hypocrites in the church and all the pastors that are stealing money and all the pastors running off with with the wives of church members. I, I've got to deal with that because the ministry is being blamed for what these sinful men are doing. So yes, there is a capacity where the ministry is blamed and God doesn't want people to not serve him in the capacity that they're supposed to serve him in the, in the conditions that he told them to meet in the scriptures. All right, so... Let me look at this one. Where does the Bible teach that a sinful man cannot be used of God? Now, now we're switching gears into a more general aspect of the question. Can God use a sinner? Can God use a sinner? And Mike covered a lot of great examples that God does. I mean, he would have to use a sinner if he wanted to get anything done, if he wanted to remain for his work to remain by faith in the world, because God says that uh, you got a whole a whole section on faith in first Corinthians one faith, faith in God versus the wisdom of this world, right? Come on. It's wisdom of God versus the wisdom of the world. But the wisdom of God is dealing in first Corinthians one about faith. It's faith the whole time. And he's saying, why are you trusting in this wisdom of this world? But if we're going to do, if we're going to respond to God by faith, then God's saying faith is what pleases him. And only and now, now think about this, Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? So if all are sinners, we can already assume in this question here that if God cannot use a sinner, then none of us can be used. The pastor of our church can't be used. He's a sinner. Me and Brother Mike right here are sinners. God can't use anybody. Now, what is the criteria of what God can use? Well, it would have to be, he would have to be used. He would have to use sinners. That has to be a given because all of all humanity is full of sinners. So now we've got to kind of dissect a little bit and look at what kind of sinners can God use. <laughs> right. Um, a sinner that wants to repent and respond to God by faith for salvation. God can save that person. And then a sinner that, is saved by grace through faith, believe the gospel. Now he wants to be used in the ministry and he's trying his best to repent of all the lifestyle and all the wrong things he's been living and trying to line his life up with the word of God. He's learned a lot. Now God says, well, you know, I can use you in this area and I can use you in that area. But then you got people that they have some baggage and God says, well, I, I can save everybody. There is no sin that I cannot forgive except for the sin of unbelief in the gospel. So God says, I, I'll forgive every sin and you'll be saved forever. You'll have reconciliation to God, eternal life. But inheritance, inheritance that you get at the judgment seat of Christ, that's going to be determined based upon your works and what of what sort it is in Christ. What work you did for Jesus by faith. So there could be disqualifications if you're a saved member of the body of Christ and you decide you want to, uh, you know, you're married and you want to go fornicate. And then later you repent of that fornication. And then, you know, you want to, you want to be a, a, a deacon in the church. You want to be a bishop in the church. Well, sorry, uh, you, you disqualified yourself, especially when you fornicated, you divorced, your wife got a divorce from you because of your, your cheating ways. And you want to say, well, well, come on, man. You know, I mean, people mess up, you know, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, you failed to read the other passages in the scriptures concerning sanctification, concerning service for God. 
So there are areas that you can disqualify yourself from. And there are certain areas that you may have messed up before. And God says, well, I don't put any disqualifications for that particular sin. And you can engage in the ministry there. See, see, see where we're going. But you've got to check it out with the Bible. But let's just talk in general in generalities about sinners. Remember, we said no one can be used of God for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So God uses sinners all the time. Uh, look at Luke 5, 8. Luke 5, 8. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished and all that were with him at the draft of the fishes which they had taken. So just, just the idea here. Peter was one of the worst failures, wasn't he, in his ministry with Jesus as an apostle while Jesus was on earth in his first advent. Jesus was, or uh, uh, Peter was one of the first, uh, uh, one of the worst failures. Peter didn't do right most of the time. He was always known as the one that's always trying to uh, back talk Jesus, like, you know, like Jesus don't know what he's talking about. And then he denies Jesus three times. He falls asleep three times. Here's a man that's disobeying Jesus over and over again and denies the very first advent of Jesus Christ and who he said he was. What, what, a, what a shame that this man was doing that. But yet, here's a man that voiced out at Pentecost the wonderful works of God. And God used this man to preach at Pentecost to every nation under heaven that were Israelites. How amazing is that? God used a sinful man. And, and even more so, a sinful man that actually sinned in the very uh, eyes of Jesus Christ. Pretty amazing that God can use sinners. But you see, look at the life of Peter. He may have messed up a few times, but you remember when uh, Paul rebuked him uh, and withstood him to his face? Yeah, Peter messed up. He sinned. Remember, he was, uh, he was sitting with the Gentiles in Galatians. I think it's in Galatians 2. He was sitting with the Gentiles. And then when the Jews came, he left the Gentiles and wanted to sit with the, with the Jews. And acted like he didn't want no part with the Gentiles because the Jews were looking at him. Uh, you, you see, see, he sinned. He sinned concerning, uh, from what Paul was saying, concerning the gospel. Like, well, you know, the Jews are God's favorite. The Jews are the apple of God's eye, you know? And I mean, that's that might have been his mindset, but he certainly did separate himself from the Gentiles, and he sinned, and, and Paul rebuked him to his face because he sinned. Now, here's a man that sinned when he was with Jesus on earth, but still an apostle. And Jesus rebuked him three times, you know, feed my sheep. <laughs> do, do, do thou lovest me? He said, feed my sheep three times because he knew that he denied him three times. But you know what? Jesus gave him that chance, didn't he? A just man falleth seven times. But Peter certainly fell probably more than that. And you know what? At Pentecost, God used him. And many were, come on, 3,000 people were saved at one time. Uh, there was other, you know, thousands of people were saved at the beginning there in the book of Acts. And then later, Peter messes up. So come on. I mean, do you believe the Bible? Did Peter lose his salvation? No, he didn't. He might have messed up his walk with the Lord a little bit, but he got back up and started serving God again. And that's what we need to do. So, Separated, sanctified service for God can be better if you had never sinned. I, that needs to be said. If Come on, I'm not saying you're perfect, you never sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But the sins that you're wanting to commit, had you never wanted to commit those because you, you're obeying the Lord, instead of falling into the temptation, it says it's all you know by grace. You know, God's a God of grace. I can just commit this sin. Had you never sinned, you might have qualified yourself for certain services in the church. But because you decided to sin, now you disqualified yourself. Now, again, those are conditional. You've got to look those up of those specific sins. Now, I want to talk about some of those. Fellowship can be hindered by uh, by saved people sinning, correct? That's right. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to 10. Um, 
for instance, that's dealing with lost people. Lost, we cannot fellowship with lost people according to 1 Corinthians 5, 9 to 10. And it gives you a list of sins and the reason why you're not, you're not to fellowship with these people. But I'm pretty sure that you could accompany uh, with some of these folks if they were not engaged and practicing in those sins of them being lost and undone. So that's why the, the list of sins is there for lost people. But then when you go to verse 11, it flips to saved people. And then it gives you a list of what you're not to company with concerning saved people. So you see that even in fellowship, isn't fellowship a ministry? Sure it is. Fellowship and with your brethren in the church, that's a ministry in itself. And the Bible says, if it, look, it says, verse 11, 1 Corinthians 5, but now I've written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother, see, he's saved. He's a brother in Christ. A brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such and one not to eat. What are you going to do? Look, look at verse 13. But them that are without God, but them that are without God judges, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. You're, you're to put him away. What do you mean? Put them away? No, no, you don't. You don't kill them. You know, you don't snuff them out. No, you you put them away. You separate yourself from him. You're not fellowshipping with him. You're not eating with him. You're not. You're not confiding in him the deep things of Christianity. See that? So a little bit of that. Certain sins can disqualify you uh, from ministry service temporarily. Other sins can disqualify you from the ministry service permanently, and it depends on your, the sins that you've committed. Conditions concerning divorce after you were saved, but the conditions reached to even when you were divorced, when you were lost and later were saved. Those conditions are still applying. If you were divorced when you were lost, you're going to disqualify yourself from being an elder in the church. There's qualifications for elder in a church. You're not going to be able to be one. Well, I, you know, I, I want to be able to serve God. Well, that's great. You can serve God maybe on a capacity for going out into the world. Oops. On a, on a capacity for going out into the world and preaching the gospel to every creature. You could still do that. You're still qualified to do that. But then even in, even in that, there are some conditions met. Uh, the Bible actually says that those that uh, preach the gospel should live the gospel. Are you living the gospel? If you're not living the gospel, why are you out there preaching? You're just going to bring a bad testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to remember we just talked about it, that the ministry of God be not ashamed. So there, there's some qualifications there, even in a good testimony as a Christian. See that? When you're presenting it to another person, the person shouldn't be able to look into your life and say, I just saw you at the bar last week. You were drunker than my best friend was. That's a bad testimony. Maybe you ought not tell people about Jesus if you want to engage with the sinners and be a drunkard. So just a few things of rebuke for people that are, a lot of Christians are clueless about these kind of uh, uh attributes and uh, these teachings in the Bible in the New Testament because they, uh, they don't learn this from their pastor. So here, here's another way you can uh, hinder your service for God. And I don't think, I don't think we cover this enough either. Service uh, for God can be hindered if you are not willing to serve God anymore. And that could be for any, any decision you want to make in your life. Well, I don't want to serve God anymore because um, I want to get married. I don't want to serve God anymore. I just want to spend time with the kids. I don't want to, I don't serve God anymore. I just want to go on a vacation uh, for the rest of my life. I mean, if you're not willing, then certainly, yeah, God's not going to keep you in the ministry if you're not willing to do service for God as a faithful member and somebody that's abiding in the word of God. So look at this. The people that that made up the church for over 2,000 years was consisting of nothing but sinful men in different temperaments and measurements. Genesis 9.20, Noah was an indecently exposed drunk. 2 Peter 2.5, Noah was still a preacher of righteousness used of God. Point two, Genesis 16.2-3, Abraham doubted God and took Hagar. Hebrews 11.9, Romans 4.19-20, Abraham was still used of God. Genesis uh, or point three, Genesis 16, two to three. Sarah doubted God because of her age. Hebrews 11, 11. She still had Isaac in spite of her doubt and God used her to bring forth the promise. Mm. Uh, point four, Genesis 26, nine. Isaac lied and said his wife was his sister for fear. But God still used Isaac, Hebrews eleven twenty. 
By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Point five, Genesis 27, 12 and Genesis 30, 42. Jacob was a liar and deceiver. God still used Jacob after, even after all of his sin and supplanting ways. Hebrews eleven twenty one. By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph in worship, leaning upon the top of his staff. How about that? Point six, Exodus 4, 10, Exodus 2, 11 and 12. Moses was a stuttering murderer, but Moses was used of God, even being a, stud a stuttering murderer. Hebrews eleven twenty four to 28. Point seven, Exodus 32, 35. Aaron was a golden, a golden calf idol maker. God still used Aaron as high priest even after his idolatry, Exodus 28, 1. Point eight, 2 Kings 5, 22, Gehazi used God for greed. But God still used Gehazi to testify of the works of Elijah, 2 Kings 8, 5. Point nine, 2 Samuel 11, 2 to 5, 2 Samuel 12, 9, David was an adultering murderer. But David was used of God despite being an adultering murderer, 2 Samuel 12, 7. God made him king, and David wrote around, uh, yeah, David wrote around, after all that, right, uh, all that sin, <laughs> David wrote around 75 psalms in the Bible, inspired by inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Point 10, 1 Kings eleven three. Solomon was an extreme polygamist and idolater. God still used Solomon. God used Solomon in the written word of God to write Proverbs, the Song of Solomon, and Ecclesiastes. God used Solomon and made him a king, 1 Kings 4.1. After his ordeal with all his wives and his idolatry, 2 Chronicles 9.23, 1 Kings 11.41, Matthew 12.42, he reached the kings of the earth and the queen of the south with the wisdom of God. After his wicked practices of idolatry and all the all that polygamy with his wives that sinful stuff right judges 639 point 11 judges 639 gideon doubted and he fleeced god he tested god called god called him a mighty man of valor judges 612 gideon was a military leader judges 717 gideon was a political opposition judges 8 1 to 4 gideon was the fifth judge that god chose who by faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, Hebrews eleven thirty two 32 to 33. How about that? Acted in faith and, and it pleased God, even after his sinful ways. Point 12, Judges eleven thirty 30 to 31. Jephthah, oh, what a grim story this is. Jephthah, the son of an harlot, made an ignorant vow to, to he made an ignorant vow to God that cost his daughter's life. And Jephthah was used of God, being a mighty man of valor, and still won the battle against Ammon, even though he made the sinful vow, because God used him. Judges 11, 32 to 33. Point 13, 1 Samuel 2, 29, 3, 21. Eli cared for his sons more than God. Eli was still used of God, 1 Samuel 1, 28, in raising Samuel as a child separated to the Lord. God used him. He used a sinful man. Point 14, Job 32, 1. Job was self-righteous. No, just was, uh, uh, Job was just. He was a righteous man in his days. No, no, Job was, was self-righteous. Look at Job 32, 1. So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Job 47, or, or Job 42, 7 to 8, Job 42, 10, God used Job to pray for his three friends, and Job spoke the right things concerning the Lord. See how God can even use Job, even if he's self-righteous in his own eyes, like many of us are? Jonah 1, 3, Jonah 3, 10 uh, to 4, 1, Jonah 4, 3, Jonah 4, 9, Jonah had murder in his heart concerning all those verses and ran from God. But God used Jonah to save a whole Gentile city at one time, which is the greatest revival in human history. Jonah 3.10. How about that for using a sinful man who didn't want to do the bidding of God? He would rather jump overboard and commit suicide than to obey God, to go somewhere else than to serve God. Point 16, Acts 2, 20, or 22, 4, Acts 8, 1, Acts 8, 3, Acts 9, 1, Philippians 3, 6. 
All those verses are concerning Paul was a murderer of Christians. Paul, the apostle Paul, was a murderer of Christians. Look it up in all those passages. Acts 22.4, Acts 8.1, Acts 8.3, Acts 9.1, Philippians 3.6. God used Paul to be an apostle as of one born out of due time. 1 Corinthians 15.8. He wrote 13 epistles of the New Testament inspired by the Holy Ghost, even though he was a sinner killing Christians. Witness the gospel to Jews, Acts 9.20, and Gentiles, Acts 13.48. He was used in many other ways that is proven in the New Testament. Point 17, Jonah or, or John 20, verse 25. Thomas was a hardened doubter, but so were all the apostles, Mark 16.14, when Jesus upbraided all of the apostles for their unbelief and their doubt. God used Thomas and all the apostles, Mark 16, 15, to preach the gospel to every creature. They're all sinful men. They were all in unbelief. And, the, and that's the sin of unbelief. They were in the sin of unbelief. But God still used them because of their faith and repentance. See that? God still used them. Mark 16, 9, Mary Magdalene had seven devils. How can a person that had seven devils do anything for the Lord? But God used Mary Magdalene to be the first evangelist, Mark 16, 10. Point 19, Joshua 6, 17, Rahab was a harlot. Was she not? God used Rahab, Joshua 6, 25, to hide the Hebrew spies in Jericho. She was a picture of a sinner saved by grace. She is in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. How, how about that for God using a sinner? Uh, point 20, Judges 16, 30, Samson was a mass murderer. He killed a whole bunch of people, didn't he? He murdered a bunch of people. God used Samson as a judge to deliver his people out of Gentile Philistine power after 40 years of captivity. And God used Samson as a judge. Judges 13, 1. Acts 20, verse 9. Point 21. Acts 20, verse 9. Eutychus fell asleep in a sermon. Eutychus. Is that you? You fall asleep through the sermons in church? Shame on you. Even though Eutychus neglected the preaching and fell asleep, which is sin, I mean, I, I think that's sinful. You've fallen asleep through the word of God, but you can stay awake through a football game? Really? Are you kidding me? You're not telling me that's, that's not sin? Sure it is. You know, slothfulness is a sin, right? And you're, you're sitting just for 45 minutes while the preacher's preaching the word of God. Amen. Amen. And you're going to fall asleep through that. Unbelievable. God did not forsake Eutychus, even though he fell asleep and sinned, but brought him back to life. That's how much he loves him. Hebrews 13, 5, you can read about it. Eutychus fell asleep, and when he fell to his death, this is just a neat little rabbit trail. Eutychus fell asleep, and when he fell to his death, this might be a picture of his Christianity. <laughs> or... It could be the fact that he was really tired and fell asleep. I, I mean, we could give him that too. Okay, I'm not saying either or, just, we're just subjective opinion here. But Ephesians 5.14, look at this cross-reference for that. Wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, <laughs> and Christ shall give thee light. How about that? Do you think maybe after Eutychus fell asleep, may be a picture of his Christianity, and then he died being physically dead? And then here comes Paul, and he's raising him from the dead and showing this guy that he don't need to live his Christianity in death concerning how his relationship was to God, that it wasn't that important. It could have been the case. That it wasn't that important that he could just fall asleep through it. But gave him newness of life after this man was already saved. I mean, he could have been already saved. But to show him newness of life and how we ought to be, instead of falling asleep in church, showing the condition of our Christianity, that we're just walking dead people in our relationship to God, even though we're saved. But that we would have newness of life as Paul came and raised this man from the dead. And that one day that we could actually get an understanding of what God wants from us and just get out of that dead life that we're living as saved members of the body of Christ, and live in victory for Jesus. 
I think that's a, there's a good practical lesson we could learn from that. So point 22, John 18, 17, John 18, 25, John 18, 27. Peter denied Christ three times. We talked about Peter, so I'm not going to go down that road. Uh, point 23, Acts 5, 3 to 4, Ananias and Sapphira lied to God for greed. You say, no, there's no way they could ever be saved because God dropped them dead, right? Acts 5, 13 to 14, God used Ananias and Sapphira's testimony, listen to this, as an example to the church and believers were the more added to the Lord because of this great fear. Wow. Can you imagine? I'd rather be a testimony by the, the right things I'm doing for the Lord, but Ananias and Sapphira were a testimony and a, and, and a testimony concerning the judgment and punishment of God, which caused people to believe would you rather be a testimony to the righteousness of christ or to the punishment that god, god's going to have on unrighteous judgments uh concerning our decisions i don't want to be a testimony for something wrong i'm doing to for the lord but look god still used ananias and sapphira even though they lied to god he still used them i mean who wants to be used that way <laughs> i don't want to be used that way but nevertheless they were used uh, point 24, and I, I was going to go to every single person, okay? I just wanted to hit quite a few so you can get a substantial amount of testimonies in the Bible that it is scriptural that God does use sinners in a general capacity. John eleven fourteen, 14, Lazarus was literally, literally dead. Was he not? He was literally dead. John chapter 11, read it. Lazarus's death was used of God to the intent that people would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ John eleven fifteen. 15, look what he says. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. Come on. When, when Lazarus was still sick and alive, he says, I, like, I, for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. To the intent ye may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. How about that? J Jesus waited. He didn't go right away when he was sick. He could have went. He could have been there when, when Lazarus was still alive, but he did it on purpose because he knew if he would have went there, because, come on, we're talking about Jesus' foreknowledge here. He knew they probably wouldn't have believed on him. So he waited till, till Lazarus was dead. And, and come on, La Lazarus and Jesus were friends. Jesus and Lazarus were friends. But Jesus waited. And they were all in despair when he arrived. But you know what he said? Lazarus, come forth. And he came forth. And he was alive. And it was talked about. And so many people believed. And we're talking about a sinful man, and the proof of Lazarus' sin was that he died, and he remained dead until Jesus came. And you know what Jesus did for that sinful man? Even though they were friends, he was still a sinful man. Jesus brought him back to life. You know why? Because Jesus can even use a dead, sinful man and use that to bring glory to himself, and, and that man could still be used of God. And I bet you, And I bet you they were talking about that. For, for decades about, you know, their kids and their kids' kids were talking about that testimony. And who knows how many people got saved over that testimony. Like, I was there, or my great-granddaddy was there, and he saw it with his own two eyes. So how about that, about using sinful men? That's, that's, that's pretty great, which brings us to the final point, which is really short here because we're already over on time. And then I'm going to close out, and I'm going to let Mike, uh, say a few words if he wants to add anything, any thoughts. He can add a few things and then he can close out. But here's the thought encompassing everything we just talked about God doesn't call the qualified, He qualifies the called. Amen. That's the summation for the answer to the question. And so you can disqualify yourself, remember. You can disqualify yourself by your own volition and free will, by the sins you want to commit. Do you really want to pay the price? You don't think about the price you have to pay when you're committing the sin because it's fun for a season, isn't it? That's why it says for a season. A lot of times we use that fun for a season to talk about, yeah, right now in this life for a lost person, yeah, when you die, that's your season. From now till you die, that's your little season of sin, and then you're going to be in hell and then the lake of fire for eternity. Well, think about this. Think about the season another way. When you're saved, people want to have fun for a season and in, in the idea of, well, I've sinned. Now I'm suffering the consequences of sins. I want to get right now. I want to get right with God now. And then they repent. I'm not talking about to get saved. They repent because of the wicked lifestyle they were living as a carnal Christian. 
And now they want to get right with God. And now they just completely think, first of all, that because they repented and they have a sincere heart, that God's just going to allow them to do anything. And the pastor's going to allow them to do anything in the church. I can serve on any capacity. The problem is you didn't think about that while you were committing all those sins. And now you disqualified yourself from certain things in the church. And you got nobody to blame but yourself. You can't blame the devil. You can't blame God. You got to blame yourself because you're the one that's in charge of your spirit, your body, and your, your flesh. You're in charge of that. And if you want to blow it, you can blow it. God says you can blow it if you want. You can destroy, completely destroy your whole inheritance if you want to. But don't sit there and, and come up to God at the judgment seat of Christ talking about why are all these people getting all these things? Why are they ruling and reigning in the kingdom? How come I'm in the kingdom and I'm not ruling and reigning with everybody else? Why am I not able to get the rewards? I mean, what's all this reward thing? I never knew about this. What's this huge inheritance that everybody's getting that I didn't get? You can't complain. You have no business to complain. No, you were like, I'm saved. I can do whatever I want, and I'm going to choose to sin. Out of all the things you could choose to do and all the things that you would want to do, you're going to lean towards sin when God says, but I made you a new creature now. The moment you believe, you ought to desire righteous things in the holy word of God. But you chose not to, and that's your own fault. And what I'm telling you is, I'm not saying remain there, just stay there. But wherever you're at, whatever capacity that you're serving at right now, don't go down no more sin. Don't take those roads anymore to sin and darkness. Stay on the road to righteousness as much as you can. You may fall in certain areas, but stay close to God as much as you can. Church, prayer, get around believers. Don't go to those places anymore that are sinful. Stay away from those rated R movies. You don't need to turn on. You don't need to entertain yourself all the time. Why don't you get in the word of God and, and, and really know God? Come on, that can consume your time. Get around believers. Iron sharpeneth iron. The problem is we want to entertain ourselves all the time. That, and we live for it because that's all we, we've ever known when we were lost and undone. And as carnal Christians, that's all we, we've ever known before we learn truths like this. So what do we do? We remain stagnant, never doing anything for the Lord. And that's sinful. And we want to get out of that. So let's get out of that. Uh, have victory in Jesus if you're lost. Or, or if you're saved, have victory in Jesus if you're lost. You can have victory in Jesus, but you got to get saved first. Because Amen. Jesus obtained the victory through the, his cross work. The moment you believe that Jesus died for your sins and rose again the third day, you would pass from death unto life. Amen. And you could be saved, not for now, but you could be saved for eternity concerning your soul. So I'm going to end it there. I hope you take uh, uh, take admonishment to uh, what I said about that, what Brother Mike said about that. But I'm going to go ahead and end it here. I hope you guys join next week for our next uh, question for the Monday Night Bible Q&A, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Florida Time. And uh, remember, the email is trustthelordjesus at gmail. Dot com. Hope you ask a question this week and we'll tag it on at the end of all our questions. I'm going to go ahead and let Mike close out. Go ahead, brother. One, one quick note, um, a little bit of um, retrospect. I have a dear friend of mine that fell into sin, left church, decided no longer to come to church, and that sin was more important to him. We dealt with him, we dealt with him, he repented, came back to church. Um, then he decided he wanted to be in charge of ministries. Well, he had just come back to church, and the church wouldn't let him be in charge of ministries. So he decided that, oh, well, I'm gone again. He's no longer in church. He hasn't been back in church in quite some time. If you fell into sin, God will restore you back to fellowship. But he may not back, restore you back to that position. You need to, not to, you need to humble yourself and put me you wherever God puts you. You can still be a soul winner. You can still be a witnesser. You may not be in charge of ministries, but God still wants to use you. If you're not saved, God can't use you. If you're not saved, you're on your way to hell right now. So please get saved. That's the most important thing you can do. God wants to use you. God wants to fellowship with you. You can be used greatly of God, even if you have sin in your past. Because like Brother Ed said, we've all sinned. And all God can use is sinners. If God will use nobody, if, if you sin and God can't use you, God can't use anybody because we've all sinned. So right. um, 
we shouldn't glory in our sin. We need to put the sin behind us. We need to we need to press forward to the market for us, like Paul did, and just serve God. We we sure do love you. Thank you for the broadcast. I know it went over. Sorry about that. Um, but this is important. Um, we just want to make sure that you understood it. So y'all have a great night. Thank you so much again for everything. Amen.